This is Outside of New York, in-depth discussions with members of the art world who live and work outside of New York. And here's your host, Craig Gould. Liz Trosper is a Dallas-based artist whose work utilizes assemblage and digital imaging to challenge the conventional definitions of painting. She came to painting after the prolonged study of political science and public administration, as well as professional experience in the public sector. Liz obtained her MFA at UT Dallas, a program that focuses on the intersection of traditional art theories with emerging technologies. While there, she was a resident at UTD's highly touted Central Track Residency Program. Liz is represented by Barry Whistler Gallery in Dallas, and her work has been shown in art spaces such as the Dallas Contemporary, Lawndale Art Center in Houston, Richland College, UT Dallas, Academic Gallery in New York, and many other galleries and exhibition spaces. She is a lecturer at UT Dallas and curates a nonprofit experimental space in Dallas called Umbrella. I recently sat down with Liz at her Deep Elm studio where we discussed growing up in the suburbs, the landscape of community level politics, studying philosophy, using technology in the studio, and the satisfaction of finding your life's calling. Yeah, and I've done a lot of writing, and so um, that forced me to try to clarify my thinking about things because writing is just talking. Writing is just evidence of a thinking, a thought process. Right. Um, and I guess writing is more polished because there's the editing and changing thought flows and those kinds of things. But yeah, verbal thinking is just another like form of expression and trying to translate. A visual practice sure. or a material practice into language is not a one-to-one ratio by any means. Right. So it can be really hard. No, but I mean, <laughs> but it's uh, you know, it's a matter of being. You know, I think um, there is an emphasis on being more mindful and thoughtful these mm-hmm. days, and you know that doesn't limit itself <clears throat> just to visual expression. Um, and if you're if you're good with words, then you know that's one more arrow in your quiver. Yeah, right? exactly. And I I will use words even in my visual work to kind of either to plant the sort of you know seed or like uh, confuse things a little bit, right? Uh, because the impulse is to read them, but I might not be using it verbally, right. and so and just kind of yeah. I really like frustrating things and Absolutely. gumming up the works. And so. Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, I, I'm an art instructor at the high school level. You're you're at the university level, and you know, I, um, high school kids, they they like the literal nature of the words and like Mm -hmm. if you want to express hey you want to express this in your work and they'll like want to like just the word in right yeah yeah and I've been there I've gone through that and I'm like you know okay how can you do this yeah leave the words out right yeah and it's funny I went to a show last night I won't name any names but um it was an artist that was that's all she was doing was like you know Mm -hmm. really and I was like, man, these pieces would be so much mm-hmm. more uh, evocative if, you know, or provocative if you could just not have the words there. Because there's there's a You've sense of self-discovery yeah. that I, and the viewers share that, you know, it, it, that is not as satisfying if you're being fed it by the spoonful rather mm-hmm. than having to hunt and search for it. Yeah, yeah. Um... You know, my studio mate and I, we've had these conversations of, you know, working in a place like Dallas where you do have a sophisticated audience 
but there are these conflicting ideas of who, who your audience is. For the most part, the art community right. is very highly educated. Most mm -hmm. of us are going back and forth to New York. We're staying at pace on a glo on a global level with what's happening in the arts. So there's nothing there's nothing lacking in our core audience. It's the you know the it's the general viewer maybe that's. Um, you know, I would say my parents, because I was certainly probably like one of your high school art students where right. they never, my first forays into art museums were with my art teachers. Right. Um, and I still remember them and they're highly influential on uh, the way that I think about creative practice, the way I think about wanting to connect with others through teaching and stuff like that. Right. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but the, back to the impulse to, um, to over explain or to over lead the viewer. Um, I, I think everybody who gets into a mature practice has to move through that. I think right. uh, maybe they're, you know, they're just sort of these natural folks that get visual language to a point where they don't f feel, um, insecure, self-critical that they're getting things across. Right. Um, but I think there's just that natural self-questioning impulse of like, am I being explicit enough about what I mean? And I also think there's a tendency, like a human tendency to want to control the response to your work because right. it's so personal. Um, you know, that's, I think, one of the things I really struggled through is like, I wanted to make the work, but not show the work. And I still wow. deal with that. It's like, I want to just make it. I want to come into my studio, spend my days wor working and making art, engaging with it, reading about it. But the showing part of it is so much more gut wrenching and terrible and difficult and, and also necessary to finish the work and to get it out there and to, to judge people's reaction to it. They can see it with right. fresh eyes. Well, and, you're in a very vulnerable yeah. position, right? I mean, yeah. you're, you're kind of naked out there. Like, here's what's inside my <laughs> head. And then people, you know, you're, you are allowing people to judge you. I mean, they, you know, you would prefer them not to judge you or to judge you positively. But, yeah. you know, they have every right to walk away with. Yeah. You know. Or, you know, rejection is, is one thing, but also as risky or as terrible sometimes as misinterpretation based on what you want them to take away. And it's not really misinterpretation. It's just their reading of the content mm -hmm. of the work. Um, and there is no one answer. Um, when I teach um, about the the foundations of art is there's three things you've got you've got form subject matter and content and you right. can only control two of them and influence the third you know right. the content happens after and you have to take a chance on failing i mean like this is i buried no bodies in this studio um <laughs> so you're seeing the guts and it really is i mean some of them really look like guts they right. look like scatological and di the digestion of what yes you know what is what is happening you know in the world but the impulse back to the impulse to try to control the reading is that um, words are so specific that mm -hmm. if you put a word in something that, and, you know, I would say almost always it, um, is leading to a specific interpretation. There is a possibility and there, you know, John Baldessari is, you know, I, right. wor I worship uh, at his feet, but, uh, is a great example of how words can also lead into a question, mm -hmm. um, and, and be ambiguous, um, and uh, really, like, it, there's a way to use them um, that that um, is more expert, is more conceptual, uh, but it's really hard, sure. and it can backfire. Yeah, I mean, if you sometimes, if uh, I mean, the the last time I used words in a painting, I tried to use them in a way where there was, uh, or I was trying to encourage cognitive dissonance, like you know, putting juxtaposing words against each mm -hmm. other together in a way that like it you, you wouldn't automatically make sense of it mm -hmm. and maybe you know it could be taken one way or another but it was really more of like a questioning like what does that mean and what you know it may mean one thing to one person but something else to someone you know or maybe like a poem where you're using words that are so often meant for very specific communication to leave things open ended and to lead to vision i mean the, you know you were mentioning writing is like poetry for me is so addictive because it is you know 
very visual. Right. You know, it leads me to creating these scenes in my mind um, that are a little bit different every time, mm-hmm. even every time you read it. Um, and the the color, color is so often colors, textures, visual right. imagery sure. are so much a part of that that um, that I think it's really a productive. Um, Productive activity to read poetry for someone sure. who's visual. Um, you know, I'll, do you write poetry? I have. I've written a lot of really bad poetry in the <laughs> past. Um, more so these days. Um, I do a lot of. Um, it's not necessarily poetry, but uh, jotting down words that don't necessarily connect into sentences that create visual sketches for right. my mind. So it's a shorthand for things that I have in mind to do in the studio or, right. um, you know, something that I noticed or that keeps mm-hmm. mulling around. Um, so it's almost always visual shorthand um, right. because, you know, that's the craft we're taught in public schools is just read and write. Um, and that's the quickest way sometimes, other than really crude drawings, right. um, to do that. And sometimes they go hand in hand with these crude drawings and, um, n- you know, non-connective, non-link, not obeying the rules of language structure, but using words and written sure. forms to do that. So, uh, so in a way they're kind of poetic, but, um, they're really more notations to myself. Um, so a lot of, jur- I, I would call it more of a journaling process, right. um, than writing poetry, but yeah, I have, um, and, um, yeah, I've written essays, um, my, uh, body poems and suspended space academic paper. I kind of had a poetic approach to that because it was the only way I could find to express and combine all of these academic, highbrow, abstract concepts right. into something that made sense of how I was digesting it in the studio. Sure. So, right. so kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, when we're talking about text and paintings, you know, I think of like Jean Michel Basquiat and mm-hmm. how he he loved to use text, but he would, you know, he would he would write it and scratch it out, write and scratch it out, mm-hmm. then misspell it, and it was all a matter of like <laughs> creating curiosity and creating emphasis and creating, you know, uh, you know, intrigue. And so it's like, doesn't he know how to, you know, spell this simple five letter word? <laughs> like, well, he's chosen not to spell it correctly, mm-hmm. and why? Mm-hmm. And it's almost like he was using that to direct you through the paintings, right? Yeah. And, and that, it's funny you should bring him up because I've been thinking a lot on like self sabotage, crudeness. Um, what are the aims of this creative practice? Um, because approaching the work that I do through a painting practice, right? I make mm-hmm. paintings, but so often what I'm presenting are digitally fabricated, printed, right. and those kinds of things. So somehow like the idea of like self-sabotaging the easiness of something, but also embracing the easiness of it, right? Like I think that's a big critique in my work is that like, oh, you just printed this image you didn't trompe loy paint it and right. so like there's something right. to that that interests me and i'm not really sure what it is and and perhaps it is um you know going through the process of making a painting there is this like really joyous reveal of you know something that's painted right. to look um as close as possible like a photograph right and then <clears throat> You know, it, it's always this like critical thinking of like, why would I do that when cameras exist or when exactly. optics exist or I have the technology to do this? But yet the substance of paint is evocative and there is something to be revealed in that, in its practice. And so it's all very confusing, but I love being in yeah. that space of confusion while hating it no, as well. I, I, I don't know. I, I, t- I totally agree because I mean, it's, um, I feel like just, just even the way we, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, uh, I fell in love with art as a kid. And, you know, my process for learning was about how close can I get to realism. Same. And then, yeah. then as soon as you get there, you're like, why would I want why to? Why did I spend so much right. time on like, this? I've done that a million like, why, times. Right. Yeah. So it's like... You know, why not just take a photo, right? Yeah. And, you know, you... Or if the photo or, is right. the measure. Right. Um, I, like you, um, started out making 
extremely realistic renderings of family photos, graph obsessive graphite drawings. I was really proud of.